with Suzanne Brule. She's in Harrisville, New Hampshire, and there is a lot to learn. Again, we all know how to keep bees, hopefully, or we're getting there. And Slovenian beekeeping is just another way to keep bees, but you keep them inside of some kind of an enclosure. And what I find this really helpful for is the fact that if you have a really strong northern wind, this is very, very helpful. So Suzanne, you are on. Let's learn more about Slovenian beekeeping. Okay. That's Kern. These are the mountains during World War I that some of the worst battles of the war took place. And there's a wonderful World War I museum uh, down in the town of Kovated. So if any of you are into World War I, you would look up the Isonzo Front, I-S-O-N-Z-O -O Front. These are hay racks that they dry their, they cut the hay, they put them on the racks to dry, and then they would move them into the barns. These are the cabins that we stay at. My next door neighbor owns the campground and has six of these chalet cabins. I already have uh, the one in the back and the one next to it reserved for the May trip. And here again is the, the Socha River. Whitewater rafting, canyoning, jumping off of rocks into pools of water. It's pretty, uh, then you put your body over a waterfall at the end. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Kayaking. This is what I call the the, the bee condo. Um, it's the only one I've ever seen. It was a it was a, it was a two level one, and the man there he is right there. Julian was ninety two when we met him. He has uh, since died, but his son has taken over the bees. I have to say, some of the best honey we ever had in Slovenia was right here. I what kind do you think it was? Reserve. What kind do you think it was, Suzanne? I, I it's just a mixture. I don't know. Yeah. It just it. I don't know. It's just amazing. Mm. So when I go back, my friend Luba will call his son, and he'll set some <laughs> jars of honey out, and we'll leave them the money, and we'll take the jars. So nice. this one's pretty creative. This is not far from where I live. Um, they just turned one of the old barns and made made a section of it into a bee house with curtains. Yeah. And you can repurpose. You don't have to build a brand new bee house. Exactly. You can, there are certain things you need to have, but you can repurpose just about any shed. This is uh, Maria. She is the number one female beekeeper in Slovenia. She, they, her and her husband do this full time. They have 500 families. She actually prefers laying straw. Her husband pre prefers the Ajay hives. So they each do their, their thing and we go visit, we can, you know, walk to go visit them and they're delightful. Yeah, I'd like to meet her again. Yeah, she's a sweetie. So this is what, their bee house. They have several locations where they have things. So you can see the three levels on the left and the two levels on the right. And then she has these log ones, which I'm still trying to do. I've got, I've got some guy that does wood around here. I send him pictures. So he keeps his eye open for her. A hollow log for me and on the back they have plexiglass with a door so you can you can look in to see what they're doing and on top in between the the log and the top cover is a sugar water feeder see it's just brainstorming it's innovating yeah it's it's, it's really cool this is looking down inside so this is a really cool place uh, named uh, Tigeli, and they have, um, I hope I have a picture of it, my goodness, I don't, oh no. Anyways, she has antique bee houses that she has moved here, and one of them is round, which is very old, beautiful gardens, she does a beautiful presentation, and uh, I don't know yet if we're going to that on May yet. I put it on the list, but we'll see. So then I thought I would show you some of the bee houses here in New Hampshire because we're up to, I believe, 24 now. So this is my, what I call my barn bees. So, and this, um, I had somebody cut this big picture window out and put a table so the hives are sitting on that. This year I added the door and I added the walkway because prior I had no access to the front. And then you can see the overhang above. And this is my bee house, which you've probably have seen pictures of. And you can see, even with all that snow, the bees, the entrances to the hives are not blocked at all. 
This one is also in uh, New Hampshire. This one is outside of Concord. That's Debbie, my neighbor. It used to be a chicken coop and she converted it into a bee house. Oh, just one sec. There's Debs. Okay, yep. Yeah, that's Debs. It takes a couple seconds for it to move over. Oh, okay. So I'll slow down a little bit. Yep. So this one here is also uh, nearby. Um, she just moved. So it's, it's in a different location than this now. So she moved her bee house too? Yep. Awesome. Yep. So you can see here, they just took a, a, re a regular building and just cut out a picture window to put two hives in. So you don't have to spend a lot of money. I mean, you can spend a lot of money on these. One of my customers in Massachusetts, I, I, I've not been to visit because of COVID, but her bee house, I would guess, is probably in the area of $50,000. It's, I mean, inlaid wood floors. I mean, it, it's stunning, but it's- It's whatever you want. It's whatever you want. Yeah. This is another simple one. This is in, um, uh, oh gosh. It's, it's in Greenfield, the Center for uh, Mentally Handicapped Adults. And he came to the open house one day and then he had me come over and we talked about it. And they had, they, they had a, a donor that said that if you, if you build it, I will give you all the money to build it. And so they, built it, they did a beautiful job. It's more done now than, than it shows in this picture. And so I go over there and, and give lessons or help them out. And several of the, the, the I won't say students, but the, the handicapped adults are also learning how to do beekeeping. This is, Russ is in, uh, in Dublin. Mm -hmm. Beautiful this area. If you guys get a chance to go on the bee tour, you should go because you'll see Russ's. It's, it's not just his bee house, his whole yard is beautiful. Oh, and there's Ray's too. Yeah, yeah. Russ, Russ has a garden that that uh, the rest of us just dream about having. Right. Right. So this notice that raised. notice that Russ does not have a bear fence around that. He, he does, does have, have a bear fence around it now. Yep. And and also, oh. uh, Ray did not have a bear fence on his, but he does now because his be his be his uh, hives were attacked by bear. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cute? These guys bought, bought their house and the people before them had a dollhouse for their grandchildren. So when they bought the house, the house was still there and he turned it into a bee house. That's beautiful. That's very cute. Yeah. It is, it's really cute inside too. Can you stand up inside the house? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's great. Cause that's oh, one yeah. of the things that you wanna make sure that you can do. You don't wanna be bending over. That is beautiful. Well, yeah, isn't that pretty? See, you, you can do so much on something so simple. Mm -hmm. You know, this is probably an old shed it looks like. Yep. I don't it's think so nice to see more. everybody's different ideas on how to do stuff. Yes. <gasps> and whose is that? I don't know. Let me see. <laughs> it's coming. Oh, that's me. That's so, so let me tell oh, you guys about this, Suzanne, if you don't mind. No, go ahead. So I named my bee house, which was my bee shed to begin with, Soul Shine. It's a song by the Almond Brothers. And it makes me cry every time I hear it. I just love the song. So I named my, my bee house Soul Shine. My other bee house is called Ambrosia for St. Ambrosia, the saint of um, beekeeping. But what I did was I asked a friend of mine to cut open a space for me and to frame it out for my hives. He made it so tight that I just slid my hives in there and everything fit exactly right. Um, that is about $1,800 worth of hives right there, just to let you know. Um, and I couldn't see leaving those in my house as a piece of furniture for much longer. So this past spring, I had them open up the, um, the bee house, cut the hole. My husband did the framing on the outside, putting the, um, the woodwork around it. And he made my little um, cover to go over the bees everything has worked out really, really great. The other thing that we did is, again, I'm into retro fitting and um, using sustainable things and reusing. The, how, the little window that you see on the uh, right-hand side, we got that at the dump. All I needed was a window to let the bees out because some bees will be in the bee house. So you need to have a way for the bees to get out. Bees are attracted to light. 
And so when they see that light, they go towards the window. So you want to make sure that you do have some kind of a window where the bees will go up. You don't want it to be across. I have one at one of my other bee houses that I have to be really careful of because the, the window opens horizontally instead of vertically. So there's little things that you want to think about. I also have a door on the front that you can um, let the bees out. And I love this bee house. You can see that I have other kinds of hives. I have a uh, um, top bar. You don't see the Warre hive that I have as well, but I have nukes and Langstroths and, and all kinds of different hives. But these are my most favorite hives and they're my most colorful hives. And I have to say that when I look out my window, they make me feel so good. So that's another thing is when you have your bees, wherever it is, Langstroth, whatever, um, Ajays, make sure that you have some your bees someplace where you can enjoy them. And I did my, my, um, my uh, what do you call it, panels. I did panels on the bottom that I had bought a few years ago. And then I went online and got these wood um, applique uh -huh. or things, or cutouts, yeah. And I just decorated my hives. So you can do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter if it's Langstroth or if it's Ajays or Worries or Top Bars. Have fun with beekeeping. That's what it's yeah. all about. I have one customer that has her Ajays down on the first floor. And the second floor is our craft room. So, I mean, if you, if you, or half of it is for the bees and the other half is your garden shed. I mean, you can really do whatever you want with it. Mm -hmm. This is the one in Massachusetts. Oh um, my gosh, is that the $50,000 one? Well, it's not finished yet. When you see it, it finishes. But I, when she, when she signed up, when she came out over to see me, just from what she was talking about, she wanted to go on the trip and I actually added a bee house that I wanted her to see because it was apple therapy. It was a, it had two rooms for a guest room, had a sauna, had um, a massage table. So it was more along what she, she's trying to develop here. And so she has designed her bee house after that with this being an inserted in and you can see the window on the right hand side for an observation. So That's she has incredible. that window on both sides so you can watch the bees. That's this is, incredible. This was not finished yet. I need, to, I need, I've got a picture of it. I need to add that in there. This is in Vermont. This one, this one's a pretty one too. This is Johnny's. Oh yeah, Johnny's. Yep. Yeah. This is um, actually on the Cape Cod. This is at a lavender farm. So you can do a bee stand, which is movable. And they only have two really, hives there, but really, they have space. really talented. Oh yeah. <laughs> Which I think is pretty cool. Well, Amy's hives looks look really nice too. She, I don't know if you have a picture of hers too, but I don't think I have a picture yeah. in here. Yeah. This, look at all uh, those this, bees. This couple went on my very first trip, and this is a horse trailer. So the tack room is now their extracting room, and this is the horse, the horse trailer. Interesting. That's also now. This is out in Idaho. He's planning on going on the fall trip, I believe. And that's it. Wow, Suzanne, so, that is great. Thank you. Anybody have any questions about anything or? So, Suzanne, let, let's do this. Um, can you bring me back in as host? I don't know. Okay, so unshare. It's a, you're screen sharing. Yeah, so click on that and, and unshare your screen. Record, no. No, I think I'm missing the bar down, the stuff down below here. There's gotta be um, something somewhere. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Yeah, it was really, it was really great. Can anybody help Suzanne? Help. Do I, really. do, do I do stop share? It should be, yeah, stop share. There you go. Okay. okay. That's woohoo, we're there back. I thought we were down to three people. I bored you guys to death. No. <laughs> That's no, all I can see was three no. people. No, there's only so much space. Yeah. So yeah. So let me just uh, let's see. We have 21 people here today. This is great. Wow. And um, I'm not gonna go into the chat, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to share some of my photos because let's see, it's already um, 20 minutes into the second show. 
So if anybody has to leave, you're welcome to leave and things like that. But Nancy and I have some more photos as well that we can look at because um, we can give you a little bit more history on Sylvanian bees. What we were going to talk about in our next show was about preparing, but we can do that in February. It's not a big deal. Oh, Jody, do you mind if I, if I leave because I've got something else I need to get not to? A, nope, not at all. Are you guys okay with continuing with Sylvanian stuff? I'm going to take off, Jody. but okay. thank you so much. You're welcome. It was wonderful. Excellent, excellent. We'll come yeah, back next month. Around. Yeah, it's going to be it's the okay. second Saturday of the month. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Awesome. Great. Okay. Maybe I'll see you right. when you come visit me. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> bye bye. All right. So we're going to continue on. I am going to share my screen and um, go through some photos. And then Nancy, if you have anything to add in there, um, let me know. Um, yeah, I think most host of what disabled participant screening share. I wonder if she changed herself out of host or not. Host disabled participants screen sharing. Suzanne, are you still there? Um, Can you change somewhere. me over? If you go over to the right, or maybe on your box, maybe, I don't know. There's a little blue box that you can click on. Maybe that will give you back to me as a, I, I need to be the host again. Or um, you could go under participants. Let's see, rename hard self now. Because you're listed as the host, and I need to be the host in order to okay. share. Okay, so let me go here. I think you um, need to go to Jody's picture. So if you go to her square, and then up in the right-hand corner, you'll see the blue box, and you can yeah. be your host. Okay, thanks, Mary Ellen. Um, the little dot, dot, dot. Yep, I see that. Click on the dot, dot, dot. Yes, but I don't see host. Mute, stop video chat, rename, pin video. Oh, make host. There you go. Never That's started. what I need. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Great. All right. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay. Thank you, guys. See you Take later. Care. All right. So here we go. So these are some pictures here. Um, and I didn't put them in any special order. But what I wanted to show you guys, and I'll just click on a few as we go along. But this is what Suzanne started with is she started with, oh, that's actually me working her hives, but she started with Langstroth and you can see that she's got the panels on her Langstroth hives and it, they're just pretty, they really are. And they do tell some interesting stories. I have one that has a, um, a grinder on it, like that sharpens uh, knives and there's a woman's tongue there sticking out because the woman had such a sharp tongue. And so, you know, those are kind of cool. Um, some of these have pictures of beekeepers. I have one that's got pictures of animals in a jungle. And apparently back then they thought that elephants were about the same size as dogs. They'd heard about them, but maybe not seen them. And so they made pictures of different things. Or there's a beekeeper that um, when the beekeeper passed, the um, animals were bringing the person out on a on a um, plate. So it, they're just really interesting to look at some of the different stories that are on some of these. So you can see that she's got some really pretty colors. And then there's a bear, <laughs> a bear with a guy going up the tree. Hmm, looks like the bear's taken some honey out of that hive. So it's just a lot of interesting stuff to look at. So let me see what else I would like to show you guys. So maybe I'll just go through, if you guys are okay with this, I'm gonna go through all of these. Um, what I am going to show you first is this is a Carniolan queen, I believe. Oops, it's very, very small. I was hoping it was going to be bigger. But you can see how dark it is. In Slovenia, that is the only kind of queen that they have approved to have in the, the um, country of so Slovenia. Um, sometimes Italians will fly over the lines. But if you have Italians and you live in Slovenia, that is a no-no. So that's why a lot of times Suzanne and some of the beekeepers in our area ask for Carniolans only because we want to be as traditional as possible. And I only buy my stuff from Suzanne. This is not an advertisement. Um, and when it's just like Langstroth or anything else, when you buy your equipment from somebody, buy the same equipment from the same people all the time if you can help it, because everybody's sizing is just a little bit different. For me, she's the only person that I know that brings back equipment right directly from Slovenia. There's a lot of things that are crossovers or um, hybrids that you can use Langstroth equipment in your 
Ajay Hives, which is great because then you can transfer over. But for me, I just want to be traditional. And Nancy, I don't know about you or um, Gail, but this is just how I feel. Nancy hasn't gotten started with Ajay's yet, but she's got the equipment and hopefully she's going to retrofit one of her um, chicken coops into an Ajay hive, right, Nance? And I'm going to build a new structure. You're going to buy a new, you're going to build a new one? Ooh, 50,000? Uh, it'll pro probably, <laughs> I, I mean, no, but probably, I mean, it, it's, it's expensive and people need to understand yeah. that if you're going to build an entire bee house yeah. uh, and include all the things you want to include, uh, it does get expensive. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Expensive. So what I can tell you is you're going to see pictures of my hives. Um, one of my hives in Winchester was completely, and it was given to me, it was completely out of um, used materials. Um, materials that this person who loves to build um, cabins and houses um, built for me. Um, and then, so that didn't cost me hardly anything. And then the house that I have in my backyard probably cost me about $500 because I retrofitted it into a, a shed that I already had. So the shed part is very expensive, you know, to begin with, or it doesn't have to be, it depends on what you have. And then again, the hives, they're about $400 a piece and you might need new frames. And, you know, there's always just like everything in beekeeping, there's always more equipment that you need. Um, so anyway, let's, let's take a look at some of these. Um, this house here was at the first farmhouse that we went to when we um, arrived in Slovenia. This is um, the farmhouse that uh, Suzanne was talking about. Just a wonderful place. The food was delicious. It's a, like a bed and breakfast and pretty much anything you wanted for breakfast was there. They make their own meats. They do their own smoking. Everything is homemade. You couldn't ask for anything better. This is a presentation that uh, Suzanne had done for the Monadnock beekeepers at one time. And these are old fashioned hives. Um, these are traditional hives that they would have used. The one on the left hand side is actually one that they would have carried bees in to go up the mountains because they had hives that were up or bee houses that were up in the mountains. So they would have carried those on their backs in order to get them up these steep mountains. I did throw in a couple of things here for you guys, just in case you needed some bee porn. Um, there are some <laughs> bees that are gonna be moving in some of these. Um, and I just thought I'd show you some of these frames just because we're not seeing these because it's winter. But here you've got some brood and a little bit of we call drone brood and a little bit of honey up in the corner. And the reason that I actually wanted to show this one is look at those gloves. What would you say about those gloves? Too big, too small? I think they're a little too big. Too big. Yeah, too big. But it's just one of those things. Okay, here's another picture with some of the frames that she had. Another look at those, those same hives that we were looking at before. This is Suzanne and her mother um, with, uh, I believe the bled castle in the background. I could be wrong because I'm not sure exactly where that was, but that's Suzanne and her mom. Some of these pictures are a little bit fuzzy because I took them from her presentation and I tried to just take the picture and they got a little fuzzy. But you can see how everybody does something different. You know, it's just a very individ individualistic thing to do. And again, they put them on trailers so that they can move them to follow. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Because I, I didn't know if I was like, nee, 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 nee. Um, but they put these on trailers so they can follow the, um, the flow. Nancy and I tried all kinds of honeys when we were on the trip. And my favorite was English ivy honey. And we've tried to get English ivy growing here, but there's certain places that we're told that it's very invasive. So it's really not the best thing that you could do. But the English ivy honey that we had was really delicious. But they get honey from um, conifers. They get honey from um, all kinds of different trees and flows. And they all have a very, very distinct flavor, unlike ours that is mostly wildflower honey. Here's another one that says, let's see, go H2025. I don't know what that means. It's probably just a, a license plate. But this one is another one that's transportable. It's um, it's got the covers on it so that the hives are enclosed and away from the weather. But this one can be moved very easily. Here's more, another style. They probably started with one house and then they went to two, three. Um, here's another gentleman 
just working the bees. Uh, he's got his bee veil, but he doesn't have anything on. Uh, that hive doesn't look really, really strong right now, so I wouldn't worry about it. But when they do get a little cranky, it's just like any kind of beekeeping. You want to make sure that you have um, some kind of uh, protection. Um, they can be very friendly because you don't use a lot of smoke, but I just never underestimate my girls. Oh, Melissa's, I don't think she's here still, but Melissa, Larry, oh and Nancy, these are some of my bee buddies in the bee team. And we went into Melissa's hive one day and had to do a whole bunch of work, put some bees together, took them apart. And this is what we had after. And we just have a lot of fun together. So I just wanted to share that, that beekeeping is really fun. And I, I really appreciate all my, my friends in beekeeping. Okay, so one of the things that you wanna do with the Ajay hives is you wanna have some kind of windows for the bees to get out. You wanna have some kind of enclosure or a cover so that the rain and the wind um, doesn't get to them. And then you just have your, your um, bee houses. And this one here is probably two stories and they just painted them two different colors on each one. But you can do whatever you want to with whatever you want to on anything in beekeeping. But in Langstroth, you can see that you haven't seen one house that's the same as any other along the way. This is just to give you guys some warm thoughts. Um, I love the smell of the wild roses. And um, so I'm looking forward to spring. I think we're down to 70 days. Just how many? Saying. I think it's like 70 days. Like, yeah, 70.264, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. But yeah. Nobody's counting, though. No, not at all. No, <laughs> no. So, um, yeah. So uh, this one has a, a glass door on it, it's got a sink. Um, you know, I personally don't like to have two stories because I don't want to have to bend over to work my bees. So some of these you would have to either do sitting down or standing up on something. So that's why I only have like one layer of like three stories gives me like what two and a half of the two stories would be. So or one and a half of the two stories would be. So, you know, like I had to do what I thought I wanted, but I don't like having, I, I just couldn't imagine myself doing two stories and having to either sit down or to reach up to get into my bees. So that's why I have mine set up the way that I do. This is just a sign that says all kinds of directions. I know you can't read it, but it's just got all kinds of directions. This looks like a very old house. I think we might have gone to this one, Nancy, before when we were there. Um, they had all kinds of equipment, but it was very, very old. And so that person had been a beekeeper for quite some time. Again, you can do anything with these. This was just one of the pre um, presentations that Suzanne did. This is the area in Slovenia. More, oh, I, this is the one that she was talking about, I think, um, that had the, like, uh, the person lives here like a duplex and then the bees are on the other side. Dale, don't get any ideas. I'm just, I'm trying not to get ideas. <laughs> it's awful when you see things though, isn't it? Okay, here's another one. So they've got the insulation from the wood actually that keeps the bees warm on this one. These are Suzanne's hives um, when she originally started again. These are how Suzanne used to keep her bees in the winter. She used to put a tarp over them with um, plywood and uh, keep them uh, dry um, during the winter. And this is how she, she winterized her bees. Asters. Okay, so I did throw a few flowers in here just because these are some of my favorites, but asters are great in the fall. So think of these when you're making your, your lists for plants or, or seeds and things like that that you're buying. Remember that trees have thousands of flowers on them. So it's a really good deal for the bees, especially if you are buying trees for your yard, but eventually there's not any more room for any more trees, which I'm finding, and um, you can only have so much. So this is a red bud that I had in my yard. Unfortunately, it got some kind of a disease and died. Half of it died and it wouldn't come back. And so someday I'll have a red bud again. It's one of my favorite trees and the bees love it, um, but I don't have a red bud in my yard right now. So um, anybody know what this is? Festooning? Festooning is when the bees will draw comb. And so what they do is they take the wax that they get out of their bodies and chew it up and make it into the, the um, foundation. So I just think that bees are beautiful. Is that our favorite flower? At least it's one of the early flowers that we love. So dandelions, yeah. 
Okay, I'm going to scoot through these. That's Suzanne's again. This is Suzanne's garden, and that's her dog there too. And so um, once in a while, the girls will get together and we'll go up to Suzanne's and we'll, you know, taste honey or um, drink meat or something, usually honey related. She's made some interesting um, Jägermeister out of what is it, Nancy, 30 different flowers? Yeah, something like that. More so, than that. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And um, it tastes, actually, to me, it tastes better. It's not that thick, um, caramely um, flavor of Jägermeister as much as I like Jägermeister, too. But um, but it's just got a better flavor to it, I think. This is another part of her, her garden. And this is her kitchen. So this is not where her bee house is, but she has an outdoor kitchen. And this is where we'll meet sometimes. And she's got all kinds of beekeeping stuff up on the walls and, and stuff like that. It's our friends, Deb and Chris, Nancy's there as well as Suzanne. And this is my hive in, uh, or my bee house in Winchester. This is the one that somebody built me all out of um, repurposed materials. I have a slate roof. And I have been told that someday this hive is mine, is whenever, you know, these people pass on, which I don't expect them to for a long time. But I, I originally started with these people and I've been pollinating their, their yard. It's um, Cheshire Gardens in Winchester. And these guys grow organically. It's not certified organic, but Patty and, um, and her husband are just amazing to work with. They are so natural and they really care about the environment and it makes me feel good to have my bees there. So this, as you can see, this is the, the first one on the right hand side is the frame showing the person that had passed away. Um, the second one is some kind of a queen and then it goes on the, the second one in from the left is the animals and then I can't remember what the last one is but what I try to do is um, try to get things that are upbeat and friendly. Um, this looks like Suzanne's hives here so you can see the, all the panels that she has and she has uh, let's see nuke boxes in the center and then she has her hives. These again are two-story hives so she's got two, four, six, six, um, two, four, six, 12 regular two stories and one, two, three uh, nukes. And then that's that's just her regular bee house. And then she's got her other barn bees. So that's what the, the mm. house looks like that she has. It's really quite beautiful. Now, she did have a bear last year. So she has definitely put up a bear fence. And um, you know when the bear came by, it ripped out that blue window that you can see and it tore into the oh, door. Wow. It's not fun to have bears around. So like everything, if you can plan to ahead and have a bear fence, you'll be much better off. What is this? It's not clover. It's buckwheat. Uh-huh, buckwheat. So yeah, some of the, um, the people that I keep my bees on their properties, um, I am very, very lucky. They are pretty much organic and they do a cover crops and they plant buckwheat and the bees love it and it's good for their grounds and it's good for their soil so I really appreciate anything that people do when they they plant things like this in their yards. Hey Jody yeah. um, I I planted buckwheat this fall for my bees a little tree in one of my large garden beds they totally ignored it. I had all kinds of non honeybee pollinators that were very excited about the buckwheat. Yeah. And my honeybees just couldn't care less about the buckwheat. What, was there something else going on? I bet there right was. Then? I'll bet you there was something else flowing yeah. somewhere else. And they said, yeah, I'll go for the, I can't say what it would be. It wouldn't be clover because clover <laughs> would have gone by, but there might've been goldenrod or something else that they found. So what bees want is they want a huge area. So yeah, you might've planted a good size area of buckwheat, but they were already on the goldenrod. So they were like, yeah, well, we'll get to it, but they never did. And so you, you did feed a lot of local pollinators and maybe if you plant it at a different time next year, you'll be better off. But it is what it is. You know, the bees do what they're going to do. Like I have tons of bees in my backyard, you know, like I usually have 10 or more hives just sitting there coming in, coming out, whatever. I hardly ever see my bees at all. So 
you know, they have plenty of food. Whatever we do is just like an added benefit because you can't lead a horse to water and make it drink. You know, like you can't lead a bee to the flowers and make them take the pollen and the nectar. You just kind of have to hope for the best. So that's where we're at. Yeah. So this is one of the hives that um, Suzanne showed in her presentation as well with the one that had the the observation hive on the left hand side of the of the flag there. Oh, this is one of my smaller um, plaques. So this guy must be, I don't know, Sveti Florian, Florijan. I have no idea. But anyway, these are some of the the discs that we um, picked up when we were in Slovenia. Oh, this is Adam and Eve. Okay, Florian. Jody. Yes. What is the, if you go back to the last one, what yeah. is the, the decal? Like I've seen you have like all these, like the- I bottom. just, I went on Amazon because I, I just brought up wooden decals and um, I found some that I liked. And so I used certain ones in certain places and certain ones otherwhere. So it's just my decorations. I'm What's not, it? I'm, I love to be creative, but I'm not artistic. I cannot paint something just like Suzanne said, but I can arrange, I love design, I love any of that kind of stuff, but I'm just not an artistic painter. And that's St. Florian, who's the patron, patron saint of firefighters. Aha, uh -huh. um, of course, he's putting out a fire. In the house out. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Yeah, but welcome. isn't that a pretty, a pretty little plaque? I mean, why not dress up your hives? That's how I feel. Hmm. Yeah, and so then yes, we have Adam and Eve here. So, you know, again, here's, there's that little elephant that I was talking about. Look at how small it is. They might've thought it was a baby elephant, but they probably didn't even know what a lot of these animals were. They probably just heard about them. There's the guy that had passed away, 1876. Okay. And this is my house in Winchester. So this is when we first put it in, there was nothing around it. I didn't have any greenery. I didn't have any flowers. I didn't have a bare fence. And this is how the colors that I used. When I did this, again, this was, must have been the day. You can see my, my bee package over there. This must have been the day that I was putting my bees in. Um, the, oh, I actually, I thought I had a slate roof, but I, ha I have a, um, a asphalt room. It, asphalt. It's totally fine. It looks great. Um, but what I did was I just took colors of paint that I had at my house. So I didn't go and buy the bright colors. But with this property, I felt like this kind of went together because this is a very natural property. So it's not like bright and shiny colors and tropical. Um, so these kind of meld into the, into the property. And I think it's, it's just perfect, really. There's another um, copy when we were starting to put in some plants. So we put in some echinacea. Um, what else do we have there? Uh, I think there's some herbs and we have a little flower box. We have vents in the bill in the house so that there the building doesn't get too hot. And above the planter, I now have a sign that it says ambrosia. These are just to give you guys ideas on a lot of things that we can. Oh, I'm going to go back because you know what? That is a video. Just one sec. Okay, so that was probably two or three years ago, um, probably after we got back from Slovenia. Um, I have to say that the English ivy was dug up because it is invasive, but if you find a place where you can put English ivy, I would definitely recommend it as long as it's not gonna be in the way of somebody. You know, they, they plant English ivy on brick buildings and it grows forever. So if you happen to live in a place where there are um, brick buildings and they have English ivy on them, you might get some interesting honey. Okay, so these are just some, some uh, close-ups of some of the um, plates. Let's see, again, the bees. Okay, and that's what my house looked like before I put the Slovenian Ajay bee house, uh, bees in there. So there's no window, there's no opening, and this is what my yard looked like this spring before we put the, the opening in there. These are just windflowers in the um, spring. These are some of the first flowers that you'll see that'll grow very low to the ground. This is another picture of the before. Let's see, here's another video if you guys don't mind.
Okay, so the ankle biters didn't make it, but I've talked with Jan and I'm hoping to get some more ankle biters. Ankle biters are bees that actually will bite the varroa mites off the, the bees. So I'm gonna try those a little bit um, this year again and try. I always try to bring new genetics into my yards anyway. Okay, this is just a beautiful picture of one of my mating yards. I don't know who that person is, Oh, it's Nancy. Yes. Yeah. I just love the colors in that. It looks like I painted it almost really because the blues that are coming off the sky onto the, the roofs of the, the mating nukes. These are all double nukes. And I just showed this just because it's pretty. Um, but these are double, um, double nukes that are in a mating yard that I have in Harrisville. So what I do here is I grow carniolan queens in these boxes. This is only about a mile or two away from Suzanne and Deb, who only run uh, carniolans. So I have a pretty good chance of having carniolan crosses with my bees. And so that's what I'm looking for is I would like to have these stay carniolan so that people that want carniolan queens can have carniolan queens. But I have no choice. It's just like the, the, um, the buckwheat. You know, I don't, I can't make the queen go to a certain yard. I can't make the drones go to the certain queen. So it's just what it is. That's another one of the ones that Suzanne showed. Uh, just amazing how many bee houses they can have going in one area at a time. You know, when people ask us, well, how many hives can you have in one area? These guys have sometimes 50 or 75 hives all in one area. So when people ask me now, like how many bee houses can you have? I don't really worry about it too much. You know, I try to stay between five and 10, but these guys, and these are stationary houses. They have a lot of bees in their, their yards. Oh, Jody? it looks like this one's a video too. Go ahead. Can I ask, how do you winterize your bees when they're in an Ajay hat? Hive? You don't have to do much at all. You just put a foam on the back and make sure that they have enough food. So look at, I mean, you can walk, they have a cement slab in the front and um, the bees are just flying around. It's, if you like bees, you're gonna love this. And you would really love going to Slovenia if you get a chance. This is the one I was talking about actually. This is the one where the cat was that Suzanne was showing you and there's Nancy again. Um, look at all these hives. How can you have enough foliage or forage for that many bees? But they do, it's amazing. This is the inside of one of the houses. And they've, you know, a lot of times they'll put little notes on them so that they can figure out what they did the last time. Cause I can attest that it is hard to remember what you did the last time. And I keep, I try to keep track of them, but it is really hard because, you know, like your hands get propolis on them or you get busy with something else. But if you can keep track of it, doesn't matter again, if it's Langstroth or what it is, really keep track of your, your bees if you can. This is the door that that Suzanne was talking about that they take off sometimes and just put a piece of foam in. But each of these hives has a door that actually comes right off the hinges. And you can put a piece of foam in there so that uh, you can uh, push the, the, um, the foam in and, and it keeps everything warm. It keeps, it uh, collects moisture and it's amazing. I know that you guys have probably seen it with your, your bees and your Langstroth hives, but um, the amount of heat that the bees put off is just amazing. It's, it's crazy to see how much um, bees in such a small space can, can put off. Here's that place again that had the, the wine in one of the, um, one of the hives and that screen helps so that people don't fall out of bed. And here's just another beautiful picture. Uh, Suzanne has done pretty, uh, several articles um, internationally about Slovenian beekeeping. This one was in Slovenia that they did on Suzanne. And I just think it's great to have all the different kinds of ways to keep bees because it, it just reminds you that you don't have to just do one kind of thing. You can do whatever you like, as long as you have frames that will move in and out. And what we'll talk about in future shows, maybe in our next show is how to prepare your frames for the future of 
you know, 2021, what you should do, what ones you should get rid of, which ones you should um, clean and put new foundation in. There's lots of things that we'll talk about in the future shows. But yeah, Suzanne has a lot of stuff and a lot of information. Um, there, you can go online and get information about Slovenian beekeeping, but she's right in our backyard. And I always like to um, help, help people that are local um, to keep going. So, you know, it's just one of those things. It's the right thing to do. Okay, so this was, Nancy, I don't remember, was this like four years ago? 2016. 16, yep, so four years ago. We've all changed a little bit. And we, I see one person that has an additional person in her body right now. <laughs> Sarah. Yeah, so this group is growing. Um, yeah, so we had a, a great time. Um, stayed at a different place every night. Um, slept around, kind of. Um, you never knew who your partner was going to be in your, your cabin. But we everybody got along so well. And again, the food, the wine, there's nothing that you could want really um when they, they do these trips this is in to me it's almost a, a a trip of a lifetime but i am gonna my plan is that i've always wanted to go back but i do plan to go back in 2022 and uh i don't look forward to the airplane flight it's a pretty long flight it's about 15 hours um you get a little bit um off on your your jet lag but it's totally worth it and um i would suggest it even if you're not a, a full-fledged beekeeper like I would sort of think of myself um, you will enjoy it no matter what I'm going to try to talk my husband into it I don't know if he'll go or not but I know he'd love it once he got there and the last slide is that carniolan queen so I just want you guys to remember that it's not all about um it's not all just about doing things one way it's about doing whatever works for you because we are beekeepers, right? Okay, so you guys, we have done two hours almost straight. I'm gonna have to cut this up into two different parts of the show actually, really, because an hour is enough. I mean, I know that you guys are really tired too, I'm sure. But um, we have covered a lot of information and it is good to know about Slovenian beekeeping and how you do things this way. Um, but what I'd like to do in the last few minutes is answer any questions or share any information that you guys have that you'd like to about your bees in January. Are you guys excited? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Nancy, is there anything that you can tell us? You said something about the solstice. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's just, we're moving toward spring. We're moving toward longer days. We're moving toward more daylight. We're moving toward a higher sun. Um, so the winter season is antithetical to all that. And it brings us down emotionally. It's nothing we can do about it. We all get some level of seasonal depression and we're on our way out of it and it's yeah. it's exciting. I did want to mention one thing um, to follow up uh, my comments or to follow up your comments with my comments on the whole um, Slovenia apitourism issue is that Slovenia is part of what used to be Yugoslavia and it was absolutely ravaged mm -hmm. in World War I. It doesn't have a lot of natural resources. Uh, it's always, it, it's a little teeny tiny country now that it's separate from what used to be Yugoslavia. Uh, and they have built uh, a huge part of their economy on apitourism. And I just want to point out to everyone that there's a movement afoot locally and regionally, uh, specifically here in Vermont where I am, uh, but it's also sort of expanding regionally to create agritourism and apitourism would fall under the umbrella of agritourism, which is to bring people from all over the world to our part of the world and show them how we do things and have people stay on farms mm -hmm. and have people tour uh, the different styles of apiaries that we have. And Jody and I are both working toward that with some organizations, um, specifically locally, we're working with the Retreat Farm uh, in Brattleboro and uh, COVID has sort of disrupted everything. Yeah. But once we're on the other side of it, things will pick up again. And it's something to keep in the back of your mind that we can all participate in this. Uh, we can be stops along the way for tourists, uh, local, regional, national, and international. People mm -hmm. are really interested in this. And I have people who, who uh, contact me and ask if they can just, can I bring my family over to see your beehives? Yeah. Can I show my kids? And there's a huge movement afoot. You, uh, Slovenia has built an entire industry on it. 
and that's sort of obvious in what Suzanne and Jody showed in their in their slideshows. Um, but it is it's huge and it's coming to us soon. And we should all be thinking about it and trying to involve ourselves in it because it's going to be a big movement. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, COVID is not fun, but it has given us a chance to regroup and rethink. And again, think about what's important and introducing children and adults to things that we love and things that are simple as much as bees, like when you bring somebody to a beehive, especially an observation hive where they're not gonna get stung, people are amazed. You're like when you know what you're talking about, about bees and you share things with them, they have no idea how crazy it is that bees can do so much. They can make their own wax. They can regurgitate nectar to make honey. They clean each other. They care for each other. They, they do all kinds of things. They are, to me, the super organism of all organisms. And I never, and I don't think any of you would have thought of this either, but I don't think you would ever think about this when you first got started with beekeeping. All you were worried about is not getting stung. And now I'm you look at this. I'm still worried about that. Oh, Dale. <laughs> this year's going to be different. It's 2021. I hope so. Yeah, it will be. <laughs> you know, we don't have years like that, but it never, you know, like every year is different, but I've never seen a year like 2020 where the bees in many yards were cranky as anything. I've never seen them like that. I think it was because they knew there wasn't going to be a lot of food and they just were ready for yeah. it right there. Yeah. Amy, I'll be right with you. Yeah. You were, oh, I yeah. lost the second hive. Hey, so yeah. Go on. Isn't that crazy? Why would they do that? Ooh. Why would they do that? Was, yeah. They were so, so happy. Go on. I know. But you know what? It probably, honestly, it probably had something to do with Varroa mites. I hate to use that as a cop out for everything, but it usually is something to do with Varroa mites. Just like a dog will go away when it's sick, bees will go away when they have a problem and they do it for the good of the hive and they think that by leaving that's going to make their hive healthy but it doesn't it doesn't leave enough bees especially in the late late they left fall none. winter yeah i know it's crazy no. i know i know it's I really sad <laughs> well it doesn't really matter what kind of bees you have you know things can happen francie so in talking to this uh, beekeeper on the West Coast, it was interesting to talk to him about the fact that how they're losing their hives right now are the fires. I mean, we have a lot to be thankful for. I mean, we don't have fires. Uh, we do have a little bit of like drought, but not much. I mean, but they have drought, they have fires, they're having, um, and he was like, yeah, the col colony collapsed, you know? I mean, he didn't really go into much about the, the mites, but other factors that are causing their their bees to just and he says it's devastating to watch these bees just like die off yeah. so i mean in a lot of ways we're very we're very blessed on the east coast even though we have winter so yeah there's yeah. that to look forward to mm -hmm. well i think that winter for the bees honestly gives them a chance to just take a break you know, like at least they, they aren't free, they aren't working themselves every single day. I mean, I know it's going to be different generations, but um, I just look at it like they get a, a little bit of a stop for the season and then they can regroup and, and figure out what they're going to do. But yeah, I mean, like look at all the almond crops and the strawberries and all of the agriculture out there. Um, they require a lot of bees and the bees come from the, the East Coast and um, or down in Texas or Florida or any of those areas. Um, but I'm sure that there's a ton of beekeepers in California to begin with. So yeah, it's, it's very sad that everything that we're going through and, and I hope that people will start learning or listening or opening their minds to the fact that the climate is changing. I don't care if you say it's not. Climate is changing and it will be always, but anything that we can do to prevent it from going any faster is a benefit to us I mean, because we see it with our bees too. Just because, you know, um, you know, the temperature goes up or down one or two degrees, that is huge. These, these creatures rely on, it's just like um, maple syrup. They say that we won't have maple syrup 
in, you know, whatever, I don't know how many years, but maybe 30 or 50 or whatever years, because the climate is getting warmer and the trees don't have a chance to freeze and um, pull up the, the sap out of the ground. So, you know, like things are changing and this is the only thing that we know will never stop is change. So as beekeepers, we all have to be flexible and we have to, you know, learn from the past and try to anticipate and we can't do everything. We're not perfect. We can't control everything. So anybody else that would like to say anything? Karen? I, I have a ton of questions about management and I know we don't have any time. So well, what, you know what? We have about 10 minutes. Well, I wanted to know what was the number one source you would send someone to uh, learn how to manage the Slovenian style hive because I have a a chicken coop that I have thought for years, ever mm -hmm. since I saw Suzanne the first time yep. of converting. And it is so hot in there all the time, even with windows open that I've never been able to imagine past how hot it is in an enclosed shed, mm -hmm. first of all. And when I have five or six honey supers on my hives, I can't imagine having two story hives. So those are my two main questions. Yeah. Where can I go to find? So yeah. let me let me touch on those, Karen. So on the heat, what you might need to do is insulate the roof so that you don't have the heat really coming in. I don't really have a problem in my sheds, but my sheds might be a little bit bigger than yours. So I do have vents on the ends and you could have some kind of a little fan that you could have grow, um, going in your, in your shed as well. So I haven't had any problem, but what I do is I will either open a door or open a window or something so that the shed um, does stay as cool as possible. So I haven't had that problem. I think it also depends on the direction. You know, you do want to still have the south, southeast entrance um, for the bees. So the north side would be the cooler side. So it should work out. Um, but I haven't seen any problems so far. So I think somebody might have to come and just take a look at your shed. But if you insulated some of it, it might help keep the cold air out and the warm air out as well uh, during the opposite kinds of the season. Um, to learn how to be a Slovenian beekeeper, um, there is a book that she has that was written by, who was it, Nancy? Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's- Yanko. He's, Yanko, yes, there it is. Yep, Francie's got a copy of it right there. And um, Suzanne sells these, um, Asia, AZ Beekeeping. So when you hear somebody say, AJ, that's how they say it in Slovenia. So we just start saying AJ instead of AZ or Slovenian. So it's all the same thing. Um, but that book will give you some information. It doesn't teach you everything. It's just like beekeeping. You can read a book, but it doesn't teach you until you practice it. I can help you. Um, Suzanne can help you. Um, there's more and more beekeepers out there every day that are learning how to be AJ beekeepers. A lot of it is practice. Most of what I've learned is self-taught. Even though I went to Slovenia, at that time, I didn't have any Slovenian hives. And so what I've learned is brainstorming, trying to think, if I do this, what is going to happen to that? And so there's certain things that I would recommend to people now as Ajay beekeepers, like I would have solid boards instead of um, Queenix scooters all the time because the solid board will help me so that I can make nukes if I want to make more bees. And there's different variables or adjustments that you can make so that you get what you want from your bees. So on the Ajay hives, there's an opening in the front on all three levels. So you could actually have three specific levels in your hives if you do three stories. If you do two stories, you get two story, two levels. Um, there are different feeders that you can use. There are, um, let's see. But well, talk to me about the honey production because- Yeah, so what you need to do is make sure that you have plenty of bees. And if you, see for me, a lot of times I will make nukes for people. I'm gonna stop doing quite as much this year. I'm gonna make them for Suzanne, but not make them for me. Cause I only have so many spaces. She's got, two or three times as much space as I do. So we will get things going at Suzanne's, but what you wanna do is as, soon as, you, as long as you have enough bees, you can definitely make honey. And what happens is you take the frame out one at a time, usually you know, two or three frames will be ready at one time. You extract those, you can put them right back in and you can do it in your bee house or in your house, whatever, whatever you decide to do. But it's a great way to get honey because you use queen excluders all the time. What you can do to get the bees to go up 
is you can bring a frame or two up in order to get them to go through the queen excluder. Just, you know, like the same practices that you use with Langstroth, but Langstroth, but it's just a different box because when you fill two boxes, now what are you gonna do? You know, are you gonna have a swarm or are you gonna have really cranky bees? So you always wanna think ahead and make sure that you have another hive that you can put these bees in, or you could take bees from your Ajay hive and shake them into another hive so that you just get rid of some bees. And, you know, there's, I'm sure that there's still gonna be enough bees in your Ajay hive to continue on. So it's just a different way of keeping the hive to the size that you wanna keep it. I'd be happy to talk with you more, Karen, at some point. You know, I love, I love all kinds of beekeeping, you know that, but Ajay is my passion right now because it's a challenge because I've, I feel like I get the other stuff but the Ajays, I'm still learning and I love to be taught if anybody you know, has other ideas. And that's why it's so important for me to go back to Slovenia in May when they're building up their hives. I wanna see how do you prepare your Ajay hives for the, the upcoming season? That's why I want to go back to Slovenia. I want it right from the horse's mouth. I don't like um, just being told something. I wanna practice it and I wanna see it done. That's just how I like to learn best. Okay, yeah, I encourage anybody, but just try to know what you're doing with beekeeping first. We know other beekeepers that have taken it on because it's beautiful and because they had, you know, people in their family or friends that are great at construction. But if you don't know how to read a frame and you don't know how to anticipate what's gonna happen with your bees, you will be behind the eight ball with um, Slovenian hives. So I want people to go in with their eyes open, but know that you can do it. Beekeeping for anybody should not be intimidating, especially if you find the right mentor. You know, Karen is up in, Karen, where are you again? I know I did a presentation in your area. In, Man in the Manchester area. Yeah, Manchester area. And then Nancy's over in Brattleboro. Um, Francie's in Peterborough. Amy's in Vermont too. Dale's over in the Brattleboro area. Brian's in Fitzwilliam. And anybody that I've forgotten, um, please don't feel left out. But keep beekeepers that you know in mind so that if you have questions or if you have something you want to share or you need a box really quick for a swarm that just happened, let people know and um, I'm, I'm sure these beekeepers will help you out. Okay, are, are we good today? It's January, the queen's gonna start laying. Make sure your bees have plenty of food. I had planned to go into my hives over Christmas vacation, that didn't happen. But um, my hope is that in a week or two that I will have a chance to go out to my hives and make sure that they, um, they have food. And if they don't have food, they will be getting a winter patty um, as soon as possible. Um, so um, Nancy was able to give me some, I was going to use those seriously, Nancy, over Christmas. Um, but um, I, I got some patties from her, but I may buy some of my own now that I have a little bit of time. But please do make sure that if your bees need food, that they have it. Because if your queen is starting to lay, that means they're going to go through more food. And then the population will get started getting a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And by spring, hopefully your hives will be bursting with bees and you'll be able to split. You'll be able to make new hives. You'll be able to sell bees or share bees or do whatever you need to do. Okay. Rah, rah. That's supposed to be almost 40 tomorrow. Interject and, one comment. Yeah, Nancy. And then I want to talk to Dale after real quick. Yeah, Nancy. Okay. Oh. Um, I think it's really important to remind people there's a lot of people saying I want to check on my bees I want to check on my bees I want to check on my bees and checking on your bees is incredibly invasive right um, think so about your bees unless, first right unless there's a compelling reason to think that there's something wrong if you do a tip test and find that you have no weight to your hives by all means check on your bees but if you do a tip test and find that you've still got 40 50 pounds of weight resisting your tip leave them alone because it's really invasive. And right. you know, even, even tapping on the outside, uh, they say is invasive. And a lot of the bees on the outside of the cluster fall off because they're in their, they're in stasis. Mm -hmm. And when they get, when, when you wrap on the outside of the hive to cause them to stir so that you can hear them, 
and know that they're all right, you're actually doing them a huge disservice. By exactly. You. Exactly, Nancy. And when you do that, Leave you'll alone. hear them. What's that, Nance? I just said, leave them alone. Yeah, totally. You totally. You, you really should. Because when you, you do knock on your hive or you do anything, you'll hear those bees go zzz, and you know that that got them going. It's not, doesn't mean that they're going to sting you, but, and do wear your veil if you go out and feed them too, because you never know. But, you know, like feeding, when I say I'm feeding, I'm not like taking the cover off and pulling out frames and I'm in out, boom. I'm changing right. out my homosote board if it needs to be changed out or whatever you're using. If you have a, a quilt box, you know, does your, do your shavings need to be dried up or something? You know, like just very quickly, ininvasively going into your bees. But that does not mean that you're knocking things around. Like even when you get snow and you've got snow on your hives, do not knock your bees around you know, that's not good for them. And so I try to be as careful as I can to just take the snow off as easily as I can without making a lot of chatter and, and noise. And if you see dead bees outside, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because dead bees, as sad as it is, there's a lot more bees inside your hive than that means. And, and it means that your bees are alive. What better thing can that be? So yeah, Dale? I'm good. Um, good. I was just saying it was supposed to be it's supposed to be like almost 40 tomorrow mm -hmm. so um, good time to use oxalic acid if you guys need to to um put anything on on your hives i already did one yeah. early but anyway yeah. i was gonna go do a dead bee scrape was pretty much my plan for tomorrow. that's a good idea too you know like again you know you got to be careful how much noise and everything that you make but i mean i wouldn't over worry about it but you got to have the bees they have to have some kind of way to get in and out and so if you don't have a, an upper entrance, then you better be cleaning out your, your bottom because you are going to have dead bees in there. And you may have lots of live bees, but you will have dead bees as well. So, okay. Yeah, Jody? Yes, yes, Brian. Yeah, last, last month we talked about uh, using the uh, wood bleach, uh, which I had gotten the device for it, but didn't have the bleach and you told me where to get it in the mask. So I ended up getting the equipment I needed. I, I did it and I took a peek afterwards and I swear that like within minutes of doing that, they were really nice and active and they're really going to down on the sugar boards that I made for them. So yeah. like Dale said, I'm just waiting for a warm day so I can just take a peek and then yep. just change the moisture board too. Yeah. Yeah. It does. We have to admit it does make us feel good, but we have to think about our bees first. And that's exactly what Nancy was saying is, you know, we've got to do what we got to do, but be careful and be mindful just like everything in 2021, you know, we just have to be nice to people. And I always, I often call my bees people by accident, I'm sorry. But, but we have to be thoughtful and respectful and understand that we don't know everything that's going on in other bee life and that we don't control everything and that we're on this earth to make things better not to make things worse. So I empower you guys to all have a wonderful 2021. I know I am. For as long as I can be here, I will be here. Ha ha ha, be. So yeah, so here we go guys, to everyone. Oh, oh Dale. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I thank you guys for joining us today. We'll see you again next month. Have a great day. You too.